Live, presented by Toyota, the official vehicle of your Chicago Cubs. I'm Cole Wright. Uh, guys, back in attendance, it's Joe Girardi, it's Cliff Floyd, and fellas, as we sit here and wait for Jed Hoyer to address the media, there's a whole bunch of topics yeah. that I'm sure he's going to touch on. But uh, first and foremost, Joe, is there anything that you're most interested in hearing him say? The direction of where they're going, free agents, uh, what they're, who they have the most interest in. Mm -hmm. And when I say who, I mean position-wise or pitchers or relievers. Like, what do they feel is their biggest need and how are they going to address it? And continue that, right? So you, you look at the bullpen, you look at some, some slots down there uh, as far as opportunities. Mm -hmm. um, they have some youth. We have a closer. But, you know, you, you're hoping he address just the slots that, not big necessarily, but slots to be filled and... Uh, sort of, you know, keep this thing moving. Mm. Bull bullpen relief, that's exactly what they're yeah. looking for, especially from the left side. Would you agree with that, Joe? Yeah, I think so. I, I think it was a lot for Mark Leiter Jr. to try to do it all, you know, by himself against left-handers, and he was pretty successful for the most part. But I think, you know, they need a left-hander they can count on. And maybe that's Luke Little. I mean, maybe they mm. feel that right. he's ready to make that stuff, that step. But... Again, when you're a left-handed reliever, you have to have the ability to get right-handers out as well because you got to face three hitters. They might pinch hit for one, yeah. and all of a sudden that pocket of left, right, left could be left, right, right. You, you can't stay on your hands, right? You can't. Sure. You, you you have to go out and be aggressive. I think when you have a team that's that's winning and you and you're moving in the right direction, um, you can't stay on your hands and wait around. You got to sort of go out and show guys that you really want them, you know, here on the north side, and and you know allow them to. You know, feel good about the opportunity that, that awaits them. Yeah, and, and nine win improvement from just a season ago, and the power, a, a huge uptick there. Six players with 20 or more home runs in 24 games with 10 or more runs played. And that's what you want to see when it comes to tacking runs on against the opposition. But another thing that really jumps off the page, 140 stolen bases the most since 1990. And Cliff, you talked about aggressiveness. Do you see yeah. an uptick in aggressiveness when it comes to their plan of attack on the bases? Well, you never want to give out outs, right? That's one thing you don't want to do. And I think the biggest thing we saw this year was running smart, running in situations that's going to allow you to manufacture runs and do some little things that I thought this team needed to do. Early on in the season, Nico at the table setter, uh, getting on, stealing bags was huge for them. Even though the record didn't show that early, it was still big as far as just understanding, you know, that what they were trying to do. Well, you talk about giving up outs. This ballpark plays two different ways. Yeah. It, it, it plays where the wind's blowing out. Right. And you may not run as much. Mm -hmm. And then it plays where the wind's blowing in and you got to manufacture runs. So I think you have to have... A, a really a lineup that can do both to be successful here in Chicago. Mm, the Cubs needing to minimize some of those careless outs as well. We saw them make a more than yeah. a few at home plate, and that's what you never want to do, make outs at third base, home plate. That is an effective a rally killer. Now we're going. Uh, Jed Hoyer, the Cubs president of baseball operations, he's set to speak. Let's listen in. Thanks. Um, I guess I'll start. Uh, I feel like the question that um, I keep reading everywhere is, you know, how do you define the season? And I know you guys have asked our you know, players, you know, Rossi, Tom, you know, is this a success or not? And I guess I'll start by saying you no. Know, um, you know, when I think about our season, I'm really impressed that our guys set goals as high as they did. Um, sort of externally, we're not expected to be a playoff team, but the internal uh, expectations were that we're going to make the playoffs. And you know, going back to spring training, that was that was the clear goal. Um, when we were 10 games under in the middle of June, um, these guys still believed. And it was a pretty amazing thing from my seat to listen to them talk about how good they thought the team was when we were 10 games under. Um, you know, in the middle of July, when we were after the All-Star break, we were still we were seven games under. And these guys are begging me not to break the team up and begging me not to make trade, which is really impressive. Um, these guys believe through all that. And, you know, they went on a heck of a run. I think we went from, you know, 10 under to 12 over, over a three month period. And um, it was fun to watch. We just didn't finish the race. Uh, painfully, we did not finish the race. And, um, you know, certainly there's positives to take from the season, both organizationally um, and certainly positives to take from as a major league team. But, um, you know, right now we're sort of st stuck thinking about you know what could have been and thinking about the you know, the painful last two and a half three weeks and um 
you can't call something that um, falls short of your goals a success. So ultimately, we have to live with that. Um, I know it'll motivate me all winter, and I know talking to our players and coaches and front office, I, I know it's going to motivate them. But um, you can't you can't define something as as a success when you fall short. And I think as Tom said, those those things are consolation prizes, and that's not why we're here. So um, with that, I'll, I'll open it up to, to questions and um, you know, fire away. Uh, with that in mind of achieving the playoff goal next year, you know, what do you think you guys need to do to get over the hump and, and get back to the playoffs? Well, um, I was hoping to have less of October to do off-season planning, but certainly we'll, we'll get right to work and, you know, spend a lot of time now that um, we're not, you know, in the fight, uh, get a chance to break down exactly the things that uh, we need to improve. Um, we're a really strong team in a lot of ways. You know, we're above average um, offensive team. I think we're actually top 20% offensive team this year. We had really good run prevention. Um, the shell of a really good team is there. Um, obviously, we have to make additions and, and we have to uh, find ways to improve. Um, but I feel really good, given where we were a year ago, the number of pieces we have that are you know contributing players on a really good team is there, and we just need to supplement that. Um, and you know we, we play very very similar baseball to this year. We just have to finish up, find a way to avoid the ups and downs as much and finish the race a lot stronger. We heard Tom give his support of Rossi, and you know, you've kind of really spoke highly about how he yeah. kept the team together back in June. This was your first 162 game look at him as a manager with a competitive team. Yeah. How do you kind of assess him as a as an in-game manager? We all know what he can do behind the scenes and you know, for the group in that way. But what about yeah. what you saw from him on the field? Yeah, um, I mean, I was very pleased with, with Rossi this year. Um, the things I mentioned before, you know, coming from um, you know, being 10 under and, and, and sort of maintaining not only just the competitiveness, but also having, you know, never having the team focus on individual stuff. It was always about the team. They, we never lost that. Uh, creating that type of culture is incredibly difficult, and he does a fantastic job of that. You know, you, you mentioned the in-game stuff, and obviously, you know, Carter and, you know, Craig Breslow and I are down there every day. We're talking through you know, who's available and, and what situations are going to arise. And, you know, I know the, the manager in a big market is always going to get criticism. That's part of the, the job, you know. Terry Francona just retired, and he's going straight to the Hall of Fame. I was with him in Boston for a long time, and you know there was always questions about what, what he was doing. You know, and he's you know going to be in Cooperstown. Um, that's the nature of it. Um, do we have disagreements, and do we have you know, heated conversations? Of, of course we do, but you will with any manager. They have to make so many different decisions. Um, they have so many things to weigh. So um, obviously we work hard all the time to, to give give him the right information and if there are things that that we disagree with or things that we can do better like he's very open-minded to that uh, he's constantly trying to improve um but ultimately you know we we're very pleased with the job he did this year and um you know i think that uh he should be proud of the, the fact that that group kept fighting for him Uh, Jed, you you were able to use the organization players to acquire important players for that run in uh, August. Uh, how how deep do you feel the organization is now? And uh, if you want to make moves in the off season, do you feel you have enough depth not to impact uh, these players moving forward and being part of your team? Yeah, I think from a from an organizational standpoint, from a farm system standpoint, uh, it was a really positive season. I think. Obviously, um, you know, rightfully, I think we got a lot of criticism in the past for not developing enough pitching. Um, I think we saw so many pitchers come up uh, during the course of the year that we had developed. Um, they had really strong years. Obviously, Justin Steele being sort of the the highlight of that, um, having his sort of a you know Cy Young caliber you know campaign this year was uh, really gratifying for all of us to watch. And, and like I said, it's there's nothing more fun for us to watch than you know, guys coming up and making their, their major league debuts. Um, you know, that what Jordan Wicks did at the end really, really helped us tremendously. Um, and we have a lot more guys 
you know, coming through the system. So that's really exciting. And then, um, you know, a lot of credit to, the, to all the player development development staff uh, throughout the minor leagues. Um, we made you know a huge jump forward, um, sort of in our um, farm system rankings, and the, just the number of players I think can, can help us soon. Um, and you know, the fact is, yes, of course, there are even players that are in our system that we'll use and trade to acquire other major leaguers. But you know, having a a really good group of young players in the big leagues, um, you know, there's the the youth, you know, the energy of that, there's the cost controlled nature of it. I mean, um, you know, you look around baseball, there's a lot of young teams, um, really cost efficient teams that played really well. So, um, I don't want to just think about, um, those young players as, uh, the potential to uh, go acquire other older major leaguers. I mean, I think that, um, you know, looking at a player like Nico Horner, for example, um, he's a great example of what a, you know, how much a homegrown player can do for the organization. He's still young. He's, we signed him to an extension and obviously he did tremendous things for us this year. So, um, I'd love to nothing more than to build a, a young, a young athletic team that's, that's built from within. Jeff, you had to put the last two weeks under a microscope more than you would two bad weeks in July and a couple, couple reasons for it. The way you lost, you get you didn't you didn't get beat. You beat yourselves in a way, but also the history of, of just the schedule with Wrigley Field. I mean, you had a team in '19 that had a bad ending. '18, you got caught. There is there something there? You go back to Labor Day week, and it was the day night, day night, and then just the way it lo- you lost in the last couple of weeks. Um, I mean, certainly we've spent a lot of time thinking about it already. I think we'll probably spend a lot more time. You know, it's hard to to think through exactly, um, to define what went wrong. Um, you know, what, what, you know, do I think that part of it was fatigue? Part of it was regression. Um, do I think, um, you know, part of it was, you know, a, a bullpen that ultimately was injured and, and una- unable to, to perform at the same level. Do I think part of it was, you know, the way we performed in the clutch, um, the way we play defense, all those different things. Like I, I'm, it's going to be hard to figure out exactly what proportions of those things led to our demise. All of those things contributed, I think, in, in some way or another. And that, and we have to, to your point, put it under a microscope and think about it. Can we tease out exactly what went wrong? Um, you know, to me, I, I thought the end of the season, unfortunately, I thought it looked a lot like it looked in May, you know, when, when we struggled in, in May and early June, um, we didn't win close games. Um, the bullpen was not um, as defined at that point. Um, we really struggled in every clutch situation, um, both often, both on pitching and defense. When we struggled three months later, I thought, and even I said it during the, the stretch, like this feels like we're playing in May again, that – you know, we're not getting any big hits. Uh, we're not in, in clutch pitching situations. We're not getting it done. I thought we were really uncharacteristically poor defensively at the end. I, I kind of the the backbone of our team the whole year was we was really clean team. We caught the ball. We, made, we went really good defensively. And we just made a number of, of critical mistakes. And I think you have to think about all those different things. You know, it, I think part of what was challenging for me like intellectually as we went through it is that, you know, I was, we were meeting with say yesterday, it's kind of doing an exit meeting and talking about the off season. And when I was talking to him, I was thinking he had a huge home run. He hit against Rogers in that giant series. He had two run homer to tie it. And then later that inning Morell had a three run homer to win it. And I was thinking to myself, like that was kind of the last like big hit, big moment that we had the rest of the year. And like, I certainly, when I was watching that game, didn't think that like, you know, September 5th or whatever that game was, was going to be the last time we saw like a, a huge moment. I think Jan had a single in Colorado. That was a big hit, but you know, sort of like in the same inning, we had a two run homer and three run homer. It's like take the lead. And we stopped having those moments and getting those big hits. Um, we stopped shutting down rallies late in games. And I mean, there's so many different factors I think whenever you have a a terrible stretch like that at the end, I think we were two and eight in one run and two run games the last uh, after that giant series. I think whenever you have that, there's so many different factors you can point to. Um, 
I feel like most of my waking moments are thinking about those moments and like, you know, what we could have done different how, like how things could have been different. But, you know, we, we have a lot of time this winter and this fall to think through it, but, um, I don't really connect those things to previous summers, to be honest with you. I don't, um, I sort of take this as, you know, this is a, this group and we have to define what went wrong with this group. You kind of touched on it there. That so many close games. You talked about it before the season, during the season. Great teams blow teams out. Good way to do that. A lot of power hitting home runs. So with that in mind, is Cody Bellinger re-signing him a priority? And if you don't re-sign him, how important is it to replace that production and then add some production on top of that as well? Yeah. Um, yeah, we blew two teams out really well this year. Um, and we were, you know, we were, I think, 14... 14 games over 500, I think, in games decided by five or more runs. That's a really good indication of a really good team. You know, I think that um, you know, in one-run games, I think we were two under. Um, you know, I think I was, I'm really proud of our hitting infrastructure and, and all of our hitters. You know, we ended up with over 800 runs, and we uh, were, I think that's top six, top 20% in baseball, which is certainly not where we were projected uh, going into the season. And I think Cody was a big part of that. Uh, he had incredible season and um, – it felt like during that run that we had, it just felt like it was just one, two out, single after another. You know, whenever we needed him, he sort of bailed us out. And um, that's certainly not lost on us. Um, you know, we sat down with him on Sunday, had a, a long conversation. We've had really good dialogue throughout the whole year. Um, and he loves Wrigley Field and he loves the, the fans. And I think his experience was fantastic. And obviously our experience with him was fantastic. And, um you know, we'd love to bring him back. We'll have a lot of conversations with him. Obviously, it's a process, and that process does not start now. You know, it's gonna obviously it's gonna you know play out for a while. But um, I thought I told him this: it's rare to have a guy come in on a one-year deal and have that kind of connection with the fans by the you know, in the middle of the season. It was really special, and he deserves a lot of credit for how hard he plays and the way he played. I think that's what created that. Um, yes, I do think that. Um, you know. The, the, the contributions he made will have to be replaced. I think that's like, you know, um, obviously, you know, like I said, we'd love to bring him back, but um, in a world where that's somewhat uncertain, we do have to figure out a way to, to replace that offensively. Uh, you, you mentioned the bullpen at the end, and we've talked about how building depth mm -hmm. within, within player development work for much of the year wasn't quite enough at the end there. Have you diagnosed kind of why that wasn't enough and, and what the next steps are to make sure it doesn't happen? Yeah. I mean, for a really long period of the year, our bullpen functioned really well. You know, we were during that, that long, good stretch. I think we were 13 and seven in one run games. Adbert, it was locking down one run saves. Um, you know, he had, you know, some combination of Fulmer and lighter and Merriweather pitching the seventh and eighth, and they did it really effectively. And when that, formula so to speak when faltered when Fulmer got hurt and then Abbott got hurt Lider was banged up at the end of the year really only Merriweather was sort of kind of able to run the whole race without having a lot of days off um that that really affected us and I think frankly losing three or your four guys that you're counting on towards the end I think that's going to affect anybody um but yeah certainly the, the lessons learned from the year um you know, when our bullpen was in really good shape, we were very effective. I think we had times to, during the year that we were unable to hold leads, uh, both kind of in May and then at the end of the season, and that's something we have to address. Um, you know, I think we do have a lot of good arms coming. Um, we have to develop those guys, you know, into good good relievers. That's that transition's not not easy, and we do just have to spend the off season building up that depth because um, you know we did we lost a number of guys that we were counting on, and that's probably normal when we said we have to assume that level of, of attrition um but the, mo the, the attrition that hurts the most was ultimately those guys sort of being unable to help us towards the end of the end of the season we were unable to hold leads and you know frankly we were also un unable to get the big hits to stretch leads out and um i think both those things contributed uh up <laughs> hey jed uh i know that you said that you believe the criticism of ross may have been a little over the top but that being said, next year's his fifth year. How important is it for you guys to go ahead for him to continue on here? Yeah, I mean, I, 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 
next year is going to be important. Certainly, I, I want us to you know, continue to build on the, on the momentum that we had this year. I think that's going to be critical. Um, you know, we made huge strides forward as an organization in terms of like the, just the core we have in the, in the big leagues. I think we established a, a real core, um, both through free agency and through guys, um, you know, coming up through the system and, and, you know, we have real organizational momentum. I think it's really important to continue to build on that. And that, you know, obviously Rossi is a big part of that. Um, but yes, you know, it is. He's not a, a new manager anymore. He's you know, he's going into his fifth season. I think he's really matured in the job and developed. And you know, like all of us, I think he wants to get better every year. Um, I know talking to him yesterday and throughout this process. I mean, certainly um, one of I think his greatest skills is is real, realizing like he's self critical. He wants to continue to get better. And I know he's going to spend the winter thinking about you know, how he could have done things differently. And that's the. Um, kind of to me, like kind of the backbone of like having a, a good organization is you want people that are accountable and ultimately I'm accountable for what happens here. Uh, I know Rossi feels that way. I know Carter feels that way. Talking to the players, I think mean, like I didn't talk to a single player that didn't first thing talk about what they didn't do themselves to get us to where we needed to go. And so um, I love that. The thing is we have a lot of good teammates and uh, Rossi leads those guys and um I know he's going to spend the offseason thinking about how he can get better, and it is a very important year next year for him um, and for all of us. Jed, how would you assess Kyle Hendricks' season, you know, coming back from injury? And at this point, are you guys anticipating bringing him back for next season? Um, I thought his season was exceptional given the, truly I didn't have a great sense of what we were going to get out of him, you know. Um, you know, he was confident going into spring training and throughout the winter that he was going to get back and, and, and be the you know, old Kyle Hendricks. Um, and he did. I was really impressed to, impressed to watch. He worked on his velocity a lot, his arm strength. And I thought, you know, even touching some 90s in his, in his last outing, um, he really had a, a, an exceptional year given what, what we were expecting. And, um, you know, certainly, um, you know, he's been one of my favorite uh, Cubs players to be around since we got here. Um, hard to imagine a better teammate, uh, someone, um, he like redefines low maintenance, you know, he's just, um, does whatever the team needs and I just joy to have him around. So, um, obviously we'll, um, not going to negotiate anything, um, with you guys right now, but certainly, um, we want to, you know, keep him in, in, as a Cub for, you know, next year and beyond. Uh, Jed, do you anticipate uh, all of Ross's coaching staff to return next season? Uh, we're going to kind of meet this week. I think, you know, given the fact that we played till last weekend, I think some of the conversations we might have had during the course of the year we haven't had yet. So we'll meet as a group. We started that process yesterday. We'll kind of meet this week, and, uh, you know, we'll probably have, a, you know, some kind of announcement next week. And could you just explain, like, Ross usually sits in that seat or he's in the dugout, and that's kind of what people – See, could you explain like what he does well behind the scenes so that there's stuff that you just don't have to deal with because he takes care of the clubhouse? That seems to be kind of yeah. what you guys really value. Sure. You know, I, I think it's a kind of long philosophical conversation. You know, when you have, um, I don't even know how many people are in a clubhouse on a given day. Let's call it 50 to 60 people are down here every single day. Um, all those people at some point in that day want or need his time, uh, his, his mood, his direction, um, everything about the manager, it, it just defines what happens in the clubhouse. And, you know, this game is, is so up and down all the time like to, to be able to, um, bring a, a positive energy, a productive energy, um, every single day to like kind of, stay on message all the time to be encouraging to the players and to keep their respect all the time. You know, there's not a lot of groups of humans, I think more cynical than like a group of major league players, you know, and if they're, if they sense any weakness, if they sense any part of you is not genuine at all, um, you can lose that group of players really quickly. And so, you know, watching him the last two years, I mean, we sold at the deadline last year, we sold the entire bullpen. And I think we were nine games over 500 
you know, after that this year to be where we were, as we've discussed a couple of times and be able to come back. Um, these guys play really hard for him. They want to play for him. And I think that comes from sort of who he is as a person and what he embodies, which is just like being a great teammate and coming in every day to win a game. And then, you know, win or lose, he's going to be the, ne- the same person the next day. And, you know, I know you guys are all around this every day. Like it's so hard to do that in this sport when, you know, you know, success and, and failure often like so close and, and, you know, games can, can, you know, you're going to have losing streaks. You're going to have bad stretches. And um, he also treats every player uh, with an unbelievable amount of respect. Uh, I think they really appreciate that as well. Um, no one's more self-deprecating about their own career than Rossi. You know, a guy got carried off the field after his last game, and somehow he's, like, incredibly self-deprecating and talks about, you know, knowing how hard the game is. And I think that's that's something that's really resonates with the players. that They, they know he's been in that – they know he's been in that position. They know he's failed. They, he, he's he's with them in, their, in, that, in that fight. So um, – kind of long and rambling answer to your question but i just think it's the kind of thing that you know you're here these guys are here from noon until a game at seven there's so many hours of the day that are spent in preparation um for the game so many hours after the game are spent you know um getting ready for the next day or or or, um, picking up the pieces or you know deconstructing what just happened in that game and that's the part that people just don't see on a day-to-day basis. They see what happened, the, the six decisions he might make in a given game, but they don't see all the rest of the things that go into leading a successful team. It said kind of along the lines of the, of the question about Hendricks, um, how would you rate Marcus Stroman's season and what are the expectations going forward with him? Yeah, I mean, certainly a tale of two seasons. You know, he was a – an all-star in the first half he was exceptionally good and you know i think you know, a candidate to start the game at, at that point and then you know really you know kind of post london i think it probably was he, he was kind of really never got a back on track he struggled in july and then obviously was hurt for august and you know, i give him a lot of credit for working hard and trying to come back but it was, he never quite got back to to where it was and so i think that's the only way to to look at his season was you know he was you know, really uh, crucial for us in the first half. But then, you know, obviously we, we certainly could have used him in the second half, but he was injured and um, unable to help us. And as far as going forward, um, you know, he and his agent have a decision to make. Um, we'll, we'll find out after the World Series what that is. But, um, you know, if he chooses to, to come back, certainly um, in the second half of 2022 and the, the first half of this year were exceptionally good. He's a really good pitcher. And um, as we've learned, you can never have enough good pitching. Jed, how do you view Seiya's season and talking to him after the misplay in Atlanta? How do you think he has felt in the last week and, and trying to keep his, you know, his hopes up that that wasn't something that kind of led to the tailspin and keep his his positivity into the offseason? Um, you know, I think his season, in some ways, it kind of mirrored a lot of our season where you know, he was, he, you know, he's hurt early in the season. He played okay. I uh, didn't really you know, live, you know, play to his potential, I would say, um, until July. And then he had a horrible stretch where he looked completely lost. Um, to Rossi's credit, we were sort of like, hey, let's let's sit for a bit. Let's, like, take some time off. Let's kind of clear your head, um, which is hard to do in the middle of the season. And, um, you know, from that point forward, I mean, he's one of the best hitters in baseball. And I thought everyone saw um, what he can be. I mean, you look at the end of the season, you look at his numbers, a guy had a close to an 850 OPS is – you know, probably ended up a top 20, 25 hitter overall in in baseball. So I think from an offensive standpoint, um, hopefully all Cubs fans realize, like, I think he he looked like a true middle-of-the-order bat at the end of the year, Uh, much more aggressive. Um, You know, I thought his swing looked fantastic and, you know, hit all pitches to all fields. Um, You know, as far as the misplay, um, you know, we sat down with him yesterday. I think he's obviously he's um, rightfully, understandably super, you know, upset at himself for it and, and, and apologetic. Um, but you know, that was one moment, um, in a, a long run of, of bad moments, you know, like I, I don't, I don't want to signal that, you know, single that moment out and say like, that was the, that was, um, the critical moment. Um, certainly it was a bad moment, but we had a number of 
bad moments and those, you know, you know, that, you know, in my mind, like leaving a runner, you know, not getting, not getting a guy in from third, less than two outs or, you know, making a different error or, you know, any of those different things, like all the players, I think, um, you know, are accountable for what happened at the end of the year. Uh, everyone in their own way probably did something they would want back. And like I said before, I think that part of why I know, you know, we have a good group is I, I was there in Atlanta. I watched all the players like, one by one and kind of going up to him and you know, trying to pump him up. Um, they know that too. So I, my hope, certainly it was a, a moment he'll regret and he'll think about a lot, but my hope is that he puts it in the rear view and comes to spring training. And you know, my hope is that the offensively he carries forward. Cause that was, that was really fun to watch offensively. He, you know, Cody carries for a long period of time. And when he, you know, sort of the natural regression, no one's going to hit 400 in every month. Um, say I picked, picked up where he left off and he was, he was really good for us. Talking to Dansby at the end, he was pretty self-critical about uh, his lack of clutch hitting down the stretch, but just what did, what did you think of Dansby the first full year of watching him and what he brought behind the scenes and kind of evaluating his performance? Yeah. Uh, I mean, on the, on the first part of that question, I, I, talked to him the other day and he was he said the same things and I was like that's just so rare for a player to be that that self-critical um it's, I think that's why he's such a winner you know that he was able to he, the, the things he said um you know like I, you asked the question on say I think he you know, he puts a lot of things on himself and I think all all these guys do um it's so fun to watch him every day and I think if you watch him every day like you guys do you just appreciate um just the incredible steadiness. Um, he's such a good defender. It's it's sort of insulting to say he's a steady defensively because he made so many spectacular plays. But just knowing that, you know, and, and the ball hit to shortstop is an out always. Um, I think what does Rossi call it? Pl play number one, like hit the, hit the ball of Dansby, you know, it's an out. And uh, I, I think that that gives so many players on the team such confidence. Um, it's also like talking to our coaches on a day in day out basis about him they just can't say enough amazing things about how he, he's just always focused on the right things like a, a game can be a blowout one way or another and he's focused on you know the positioning our players the right way um he never stops thinking about winning i guess is the best way to say it i, I truly believe that he's a player who does not care about anything other than winning um and you know that's a rare thing. Whereas like, I think that's what he's focused on waking up and that's what he's focused on going to bed at night. And, um, he told us that when he, we were recruiting him and, uh, he certainly played out. So it was really fun to watch. It was, you know, he had a, a great season. I know he regrets some, some big clutch at bats at the end of the year. I think he probably feels like he wore down a little bit physically and that's something we'll, we'll work on. But, um, you know, as a free agent signing to come in here and be even better than advertised is, is a hard thing to do. Chad, uh, knowing that uh, the only technically possible free agent out there that you can talk to right now is Bellinger, um, would you take this time over the next month to talk to uh, him and Boris uh, moving forward? Or um, if that's not the case, uh, the way he talked in the past tense, can you wait until maybe late January or early February to make a decision knowing that he will be one of the top free agents out there in the agents. History is always about waiting until the last minute. Um, yeah, I, I don't think I can really answer that question. Um, obviously, I, I like I said before, I think the world of Cody, um, we are certainly going to be in communication. Um, if we are in communication, I'll try to keep that as quiet as humanly possible. It doesn't help us in any way to have that out there. Um, but it's good. I think you're always trying to sell um, free agents on what it's like to play in Chicago. And there's nothing better than you know having a guy um, experience for a year and openly say he loves it. I think that's um, that gives us a you know certainly it gives us a shot. We don't have to recruit him very hard. I think he knows what this place is all about, and I know he loved it. Uh, a lot of the talk coming into this year was this is a step forward. You know, I, I think Carter even said selling free agents. We, you weren't telling them this is a hundred win sure. roster. It, when this offseason ends, how important is it to look on paper and say this is a World Series contender, that this is not 
a team looking to win 85 games, but be at the top of the division sure. and be talked with the Dodgers and Atlanta and things like that. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think it's really important. I would say that, um, and I said this, I think, I don't know if you were in Atlanta or not, but like I said this in Atlanta, like, you know, when you look across the field and you watch them play, like I love playing series like that because you really, that's what the standard has to be. You know, that was where you looked at the Yankees when I was in Boston. That's where we looked at the Cardinals when I first got here. And Atlanta is that team now. You look across the field and, and that's, you know, that's how you get to 20% World Series odds, you know, is to have a roster like that. Um, can we create that in one off season? Like, no, right? it, it, that's really difficult. Um, the key is, is to build a team that we feel like, you know, gives us a good chance to make the postseason. When you get, the, get in the postseason, anything can happen, which is part of why it's going to be really painful to watch games this afternoon is knowing that, you know, we had the ability to, to have that chance and, and we, we didn't finish the race. And I think that is, that, that has to be the goal. Um, you know, it takes steps to get to a, the place where those teams are, are at that we're, you know, it's not going to take, it's not going to be one off season to, to make that leap. I think when people look at our roster, they're going to know it's a playoff caliber roster and hopefully we can, we can add to that roster. But I think to, to, to make the leap up to Atlanta territory, that's going to take a little bit of time. Has a Dansby already been in your ear about making, <laughs> getting to there, getting back to where Atlanta is, and and how do you describe that side of your partnership? Um, yeah, Carter and I off offered him an office in the, you know, he said he'd only he'd only do it if he could have one of those badges that you can like pull away from your, you know. I told him he had to wear khakis. He said that was a deal breaker. So, um, you know, certainly he's going to be involved. Uh, he wouldn't not be involved. Um, he'll probably be around here. You know, a fair amount this winter, I think, you know, because, you know, Ma Mallory and, and her soccer and stuff like that. So um, I love that aspect of when we talked about him being a winner. And um, I know he's going to be in our ear um, playing assistant GM. Uh, but uh, I like that partnership. And he, like I said, he just wants to win. He's going to throw ideas at us that he believes will add to winning. And uh, we'll probably take some and listen to him and some others we may we may not. But um, we do like that partnership. And that, uh, it's, it's, it's great that his heart's always in the right place some of the guys internally that maybe can take a big step forward for you next year. You know, Morell seems like a guy who's, you know, shown that star potential, you know, how important is it for him to, to find one defensive position? I know you guys talked about that over the course of the season versus the utility role and yeah. how much do your off season decisions and plans yeah. ultimately impact that? Yeah. We're going to keep having conversations about exactly kind of what to have him focus on this winter. Um, but yeah, I think it's hard. He's never really been able to play every single day at one spot. Um, yeah, I think he can. He's such a good athlete. He's got a great arm. He's got good hands. Like I think it, it's both on him, but also on us to to sort of help him improve as a defender and get to one place because the you know, power is real. You know, he's dangerous. I think we you know we didn't have a lot of guys in the lineup that could change the score that quickly. I think our so much of our offense was built on getting on base and, 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 and singles. And like, you know, we didn't, we were middle of the pack in terms of home runs, but certainly we were not, you know, top, you know, we had a, a number of guys with 20, but we didn't have many guys like him that is, you know, were a threat all the time. And that, and that's, that's real. And, you know, you want that in the lineup. So um, we need to, you know, work hard on finding, you know, one spot. Um, and we'll be talking about exactly what that spot might be. Yeah, you mentioned Justin earlier and just how do you assess his season and what it, you know, could mean for you guys in terms of like when you look at your needs and roster building for the off season, having him and what he did this season, what does that mean? Yeah. I mean, probably we've spent a lot of time talking about the position players, but um, of all the, you know, really pleasant surprises, I think, you know, his, him sort of going from a you know, really good pitcher to stepping up and pitching like an ace all year was probably the biggest, um, you know, I give him so much credit, you know, I, I I think so much of what we see in season is born of what people do in the off season. And we challenged him at the end of last year. Like, you know, there's a lot more in the tank for you. Like you need to, you know, live in Arizona, work out like crazy, come to spring training in great shape. And he did all those things and he showed up in spring training in great shape. And I felt like his stamina in game was not noticeably different. Um, I thought he, in a lot of games he was getting stronger as the game went on. And, you know, I thought, um, 
there's not much more you can say about his season. I, you know, obviously he faltered a little bit at the end, um, whether that was fatigue from being sort of past where he is traditionally in, in, in innings or whether that was just, you know, what happened and it wasn't based on fatigue. We'll never know that, but um, what a exceptional season. And um, every time he took them out, I thought we we're going to win. And that's like, you know, that's the best thing you can probably say about a starting pitcher. And um, I know he, you know, felt great, felt strong at the end of the year. And I think that um, he'll keep working out like that in the off season. I think he, um, he's a great example for all our young players that you can take yourself from, from really good to great, you know, through hard work. Uh, on the pitching side, Jamison Tyone, I know you guys sent him to the free agent deal. How much are you hoping that the last couple of weeks or and how he performed can be more indicative of who he can be next year and beyond? Yeah. You know, certainly I don't think Jamison had the year that, that he was hoping for. You know, he had some some periods of real struggles, you know, mostly against left handed hitters. Uh, he was so um home run susceptible at times during the course of the year. Um yeah, you know, I thought he he finished strong and had some really good starts for us. And I thought, you know, in the second half he had a number of really important, you know, key starts for us. Um he's been a good pitcher in this league for a long time. I know he's gonna be motivated by not having the year he wanted and um you know, he's a big part of the rotation going forward. Just a bit, just about like how this year was big and establishing a new standard and a winning culture around here. What's the key to carrying that over to next season when there will be inevitable roster changes? And also, in addition to that, like how important was it to get like Nico and Ian under extensions to know that like they'll be here and they'll continue to help set the standard with Dansby and some of the other guys? Yeah. Um, no, I was thinking about I, we're going to meet with Ian later this week, and I was thinking about his year um, prior to his meeting. And I was thinking that, you know, getting that deal done in the middle of April or whatever, early April, it, it feels like a hundred years ago. You realize how long these, these seasons are. That seems like a different lifetime ago. Um, but no, that looking back, that was really critical to get those guys, you know, signed to extensions. And I don't think we'd feel the same way right now about that core group. You know, if Ian was a free agent, if Nico only had two more years, I think having, that group of players, you know, signed through 2026 um, is really key. I feel great about that core. And I think when you talk about um, kind of new standard or things like that, um, I'm very aware. Like, we had a great um, culture in the clubhouse this year. These guys had a great vibe about them. Um, you cannot bottle that up and carry it to the next year. Like, every year is a new a, a new a group of players, um, new energy, new dynamics in the clubhouse. Um it's nice to know that we have that core group of guys. I know exactly what they believe in. I know what they care about. And I think um, when we have a new group of players around those guys and there's going to be new additions, I know those guys will do everything to, to make sure that the standard is set. Um, but it's hard. Every every year is different. Every, every clubhouse is different. But those guys will make sure that it's a, a positive environment for sure. Jed, you didn't get to see... Pete Crow Armstrong, like you would in a development year, what did you make of what you saw from him at this level? Uh, what do you hope he kind of took from this experience, yeah. and how do you kind of view him as your roster building sure. for next year? Um, you know, he struggled uh, at the plate when he was here. Um, and I told him this. Um, I sat down with him on Sunday and told him this. Like, I actually believe that, was, that that will end up being the single best thing that could happen to him in a lot of ways. Um, you know, he's such an exceptional defender. I think everyone saw that. He's he's going to prevent so many runs defensively. Um, I think as he sort of refines his, his base running and stolen base, you know, he's going to have such an impact on the bases. Um, he is a good hitter. I think he's, you know, certainly, um, you know, uh, we probably realize that he has to make certain changes um, offensively. And I think realizing that now um, is really key. I think this is the... The, this is the big leagues. This is the, the best league there is, and the pitching is a lot better than it is in, in the minors. And I think seeing that up close and personal and realizing, okay, there's probably adjustments I have to make. And I told him, I said, hey, you know, I watched Anthony Rizzo hit 141 over roughly 150 plate appearances in, in, in 2011. And he was a top 10 prospect. He had incredible minor league numbers. He came up to the Padres and – I mean, literally at 141, he looked terrible. And we sat him down at the end of the year and, and said, like, okay, you, you saw what it's about. You have to go make real changes. And, you know, thankfully, uh, the Padres traded him to here after we, after we came here um, because he hit 141. Um, 
but he showed up in spring training the next year and he had completely altered his swing. He like, he realized there were certain pitches he couldn't get to and he needed to make those adjustments and he made those changes. And I think he hit 285 in the next year in, in half a season. There's no way he makes those changes if he doesn't struggle. And, you know, struggles are really, really hard to watch and struggles are hard to, to go through as a player. But if you, if you take them to heart and you're willing to, to go work on it, I think it can be the single best thing that ever happened. So I, I really believe that, um, you know, certainly I wish he'd come up and hit 500 and led us to four more victories. That didn't happen. Um, but second to that, I think having that experience where I think he's going to take that to heart and go make those changes, I think is, is really important because he's going to be a, a good and very impactful player in this league for a long time. I know you're going to say we don't talk about payroll, but um, I was, you know, when you get this close to the playoffs and you're like that close to the CBT and you have this winning culture you talk about, you saw everyone saw Wrigley Field kind of back this year. Is it a time to maybe be a little more aggressive and less rational heading into this offseason? How do you look at that organizationally um, at this moment? Should I just quote you and say I don't talk about it? Or? <laughs> Um, I'm not going to talk about any specifics, as you know, but, um, you know, listen, I think, um, Tom and Crane were really aggressive, you know, with the payroll this year. I think that we, we, we pushed, um, the envelope this year and we were aggressive to build this team. Cause I think we, they believed we could, um, compete and we did. And I think that momentum is something we certainly want to, want to capture and, and continue. Um, and that's what I'll say about it. <laughs> <laughs> say like the best currencies you have are like young talent and mm -hmm. payroll flexibility is that a fair way to um, well, I think what look he was, at this I think what Theo was referring to he was kind of talking about organizational health you know I think that when you when you get to a place when you don't have prospects and you don't have available dollars you're stuck and I think we're in a place right now where you know our books are, are clean long term you know, certainly uh, we do have young players. I think I think the organizational health is really strong, and you know we will sit down like every team will over the next you know few weeks and, and kind of talk through where we are financially. We haven't we haven't done that yet, but like I said before, I, I think there was an aggressiveness going into this season, and certainly we 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 realized that I think that that aggressiveness that they showed financially has created some real momentum. Yeah, kind of along the lines of what you were saying about PCA. Like, how do you take that top five ranked? farm system and help it push you closer to being World Series contenders. We saw a lot of guys come up this year who didn't really get long looks. Canario, uh, yeah. Mervis, PCA. How do you know, you know, how do you find out if there's some guys knocking the door behind them? How do you yeah. find out whether those guys belong in the lineup? Yeah, it's hard. You know, I think that um, when I look around baseball, it's one, it's one of the biggest challenges is how do you um, compete at the highest level while also breaking players in because you know some guys like you know matt mcclain for example will come up with cincinnati and not miss a beat even put a better numbers they did in the minors and like that happens we had that with you know chris bryant you know for example where like he never really ever had a, a struggle early on like that happens sometimes you also have other situations where you know whether it's you know, kyle schwarber or ian happ you know those guys end up having to struggle and, and get set down like there's really there's really no uh, way to know some players are going to have some struggles early on and some won't. And we have to find ways to, to win while it's happening, you know? And I think part of that is having that core of veteran players that pro provide the stability to make sure that I would say that those guys can kind of provide that umbrella uh, where some of those young players can, can hit towards the bottom of the lineup. They can struggle at times because at some point you're going to have to break those players in. There's no way to be a really great organization if you're not willing to give those at-bats and those innings to young players, some are going to thrive and some won't. But if you don't allow them that opportunity, you're going to watch them thrive in other cities, which is the most painful thing. So uh, that's that's a, a real challenge for us. It's a great challenge for us because, um, you know, there's been times we had a ton of young talent and there's been times when the minor league system, you know, became barren. We traded guys away, had some – some drafts that we struggled in and we, we had times we didn't have that young talent and that's the worst place to be. So um, having to try to figure out how to break a bunch of guys in, like that's a good problem to have, but it's it's a challenge nonetheless. The, 
The uh, GM meetings are about a month away. Um, from the perspective of um, trades or free agency, you know, when, when it looks like you have a good farm system, how much time do you and your front office have to spend on scouting the other 30, 29 teams, front offices and the direction they're going to, to be in line, to be ready to make deals quickly if you want to, you know, starting in November? Yeah, we will spend a lot of time over the next month. Um, unfortunately, I wish we were advanced scouting, but um, we'll spend a lot of time over the next month getting ready for the GM meetings in, in the off season. And um, there's a lot of different layers to that, you know, knowing the players, you know, knowing um, this, you know, the, the, the buy sell demands that, you know, this, who, what, you know, what surplus is out there. Um, you know, to me, that parts of that are the really fun part of the job, trying to figure out you know, an off season plan. Uh, oftentimes those plans are, are uh, no longer useful after one thing goes goes wrong in mid-November. But uh, certainly, you know, for example, you know, I can say this, like, you know, you know, we Cody was our number, like our top target, you know, going into the off season. And we said, we, we need a center fielder. Um, we thought he was going to get non-tendered by the, by the Dodgers. And, um, you know, that was that was one where, like, you know, all that planning at this time of year really paid off that we had, you know, watched a ton of video on him. We focused on him. And, you know, sometimes those plans go exactly as you hope. And sometimes, you know, a player goes, you know, resigns with his current team or something happens and, and it blows that up. So uh, we're pretty good at working through plan A through, you know, Z. Um, but the planning part, um, that's the job. You know, be super diligent and creative and, um, you know, We'll take a little bit of time to, to have meetings at the end of the year with the coaches and the players and probably a little bit of time to get over the sting of the end of the season, and then we'll get right back to work. How cool is it that for the first time uh, since you've been here, maybe, a lot of people are interested in young players in this organization to be trading for? And, uh, I mean, maybe since you you came with Theo, you know, 12 years ago. Yeah, well, I, mean, I think, you know, it it's come with a lot of hard work. Our player development staff has done a great job. Um, they put us in position to have a lot of that currency. But like I said, I, I don't want to just think about it as currency. I also think like, um, you know, there's, there's nothing better than having a, a lot of young players that can come up and contribute. And we talk about depth and those guys provide real depth. And I, I don't want to just think about it as, you know, coins to go get major leaguers. These guys are going to help us contribute. They're going to contribute to a lot of wins here. So I think that's really important. This is kind of an offshoot of, of Mooney's question, but um, w you know, having some cost certainty with the core that you guys have for the next couple of years, philosophically, w when you look at like the luxury tax threshold stuff, how do you weigh you know going over it for a big purchase item or something that will supplement you know the roster and, and maybe fill in depth and and kind of get you where you think the roster can can get to the postseason like how do you weigh that and and, and how do you weigh that i guess with tom yeah. as well I, say, I don't i don't weigh it alone um is the answer i think that'll be a lot, a lot of conversations with, with tom and the family you know you know with crane and, and and the business side um there's been a willingness to go over in the past you know we we were over um i don't remember exactly all the years we were over but a number of times um, as the previous core got more expensive and as we needed to supplement the roster, we, we did go over. So philosophically, we've shown a willingness to do it. And, you know, I think it's a, you know, both, a, both a budgetary question, but it's also just, you know, we want to make sure that um, strategically, you do, strategically you do it at the right time. And so we'll have those discussions. But like I said, there's no, there's no organizational um, mandate against it as has been shown in the past. Jed, I'm just curious how you guys view that catching situation moving forward. Like this was a pretty big year of transition at, mm -hmm. in that department, but like what Gomes provided, what you've seen from Amaya, and, and how you see that carrying into next year and beyond. Yeah, um, you know, without sort of talking too much about next year, I'll talk about this year. I thought um, I really liked that that pairing at the end of the year. Uh, Jan had a phenomenal year for us. Um, you know, behind the plate, I thought you know, his. The number of big hits he got for us and you know, and big at bats was was remarkable, and then this like the presence he provides with the pitchers in the clubhouse. I know that the coaching staff kind of views him almost as a you know, you know player coach in a way that like he he's, he, the, he he sees things as a veteran and he sees things because he's really thoughtful that oftentimes players would would miss and so um, 
he's you know he's a favorite among the players he's a, a favorite among the coaching staff for a reason and um he's been really good also working with um amaya uh, who i thought had a really good year certainly um you know sitting here a year ago uh, i did not expect amaya to, to you know be up that much during the course of the season provide that much impact for us um you know credit to him he'd been hurt so much to getting in great shape over the winter and you know and frankly staying healthy he was a really top prospect before he had you know you know the tommy john the list frank injury like he had a serious injuries but he's come back from that and um he's gonna be a really good major league player so um, i think those two guys had a really good year and those are both guys that you know we can we can bring forward awesome um we have the medical meeting uh tomorrow so i, I told jason that we would like provide updates on everybody uh after tomorrow and um by the way, thanks, thanks to all you guys. I know the season's long for us. It's long for you guys, too. So uh, recharge, and um, we'll see you guys at the GM meetings, if not sooner. <laughs> thanks, guys. See ya. So, Matt.